So, hi everybody. Uh, so, I'm here today to tell you about our experience at Red Hat when it comes to uh, switching to Swift. Last June, we were talking about um, writing our 2.0 version of AeroGear libraries, and um, out of WWDC, Swift came out. And um, we are then wondering which way we will go. Shall we stick to known territory and uh, write our library in Objective-C or switch to Swift? And obviously, because I'm here today talking about Swift, you know that we went the Swift way. Yeah. As always, uh, early adoption path is, is not always easy. Swift evolved quite quickly, um, since, especially during summers, and every new version of uh, um, Xcode beta brings its um, bunch of uh, compilation error because the language gets refined, the uh, uh, Cocoa uh, API um, gets refactored also. Uh, so you have to deal with that. And that's, um, that's a picture of me, actually a drawing of, of me, uh, when installing um, uh, Xcode 6.0 uh, golden release and just wondering, oh, what's going next? We also had to deal with a lake of tooling, like for example, we didn't have Cocoa Pods uh, until Christmas uh, with the um, O36 uh, release of Cocoa Pods, we could get rid of the GitHub um, Submodule and that was really great. We didn't have uh, Travis was not ready. We had uh, to deal with uh, uh, Xcode the source kit crashes, uh, no coloring. I mean, you know the story. <laughs> um, and um, we also writing um, um, Cordova plugins on, on iOS side and obviously no, no support on Cordova yet. But I'm not here to complain all the way because you know switching to Swift also bring is a is lot of um, rewardings. So it's not just, you know, complaints. Of course, Swift is a nice looking language, so it's easy to grasp. Um, I think it, it's got everything to attract uh, newcomers. Uh, it also is a Swift of paradigm. And with Swift, you've got a lot of more uh, new um, paradigm and new tools to put in your developer tools. So, that's really great, and um, that's what my talk is about. I would like to share with you some of the superpower, it's really superpower, that, um, that comes with Swift. The first thing um, you may stumble upon when switching to Swift is optional. As Dimitri said, it's, it's nothing really complicated. It's just, um, it's just a box, and the box could be empty or the box could um, have somebody, something inside. It could be a, a cat or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but don't actually underestimate the, the power, the superpower of this simple question mark. Because this question mark is to save you from the one billion dollar mistake, you know, like Sir Ors um, named the uh, nullable type. What is a nullable type? It's simply when you have an object reference which is assigned to null by default. And then when you want to use an object called a method on it, you need to verify whether or not it has been initialized. Otherwise, you, you will bump into a, a sec fault. And you may hark that in Objective-C, we didn't have the problem because Objective-C comes from a small talk side. And when you send a message to a nil instance, nothing happened. So, no problem here. But it's nothing really better than to accumulate the error and, um, and deal with it later, way after it happens. So, Swift answer to uh, the number type is optional. Swift say, okay, let the compiler deal with uh, nullable. So, how do you use them? It's pretty easy, actually. So for example, uh, this is a code snippet extracted from the uh, uh, AeroGear HTTP library. Here we want to create a HTTP request. And we may or may not have some uh, headers and uh, some parameters here, so I just mark them optional. Then later in the code, if I want to use uh, those parameters, I need to unwrap the box, meaning I need to check whether or not the uh, uh, the, the actual value is there. So I can just check with a simple if statement like I do here. So I check that uh, if the header is different than nil, then I just unwrap with the exclamation mark uh, the header. 
Another way of doing it would be to use the if let statement, like we do here. And here we will have a local variable which will hold the unwrapped value for you. So you notice the difference in the code, it's very subtle, but here there is no exclamation mark when you use header. Another thing to know about optional is that uh, you can uh, shen then. It's very practical if you want to avoid the um, if let indentation L, I would say, you know, you do several if let. Uh, just use optional shenning and just unwrap the last value you need. So we've been talking about the question mark. Let's talk about the dot. The dot, what I mean, it's property access. Remember in Objective-C we have several ways of accessing property. You can access them with a dot notation or you could, uh, instead of using the sending message one, uh, you could have an add property, add sanitize, and have an underlying instance variable. Um, you could then, if you mark them as synthetize, uh, use either self property or by convention, use the underscore property name within your code. I mean, lots of different way of dealing with properties. Uh, some convention, but different ways. So when I first um, moved to Objective-C, I found this very confusing. So I really like um, in Swift, I think it's really um, very easy to declare property and uh, the syntax is unified. In Swift, actually, you can have two types of properties, store properties uh, that are just stored within the object, and computed properties. Computed properties are property that doesn't have any um, backstore. So uh, meaning that uh, the very use, for example, when you do co conversion, uh, suppose you have um, your temperature store as a degree Celsius, and then you want the, your temperature in Fahrenheit, so it would be perfect fit for a computed uh, property. But I'd like to show you one way that we use them in, um, in one of our library. This is a snippet uh, extracted from uh, Aerogear uh, uh, OF2 library. And you know, in the purpose of OF2, you, you want to kick the OF2 dance, and basically, you're going to ask your user to grant access to one of his uh, resources. Then uh, if, everything, if everything goes well, you will end up with an access token. And this is a very sensitive data. Um, so you may want to store them permanently. And the best place for that would be the key shell. It's secure. <clears throat> so here we have um, a key shell wrapper. So it's just a, a key shell object to read and write in the key shell. And the way we use store property here, which I think is pretty clever, is instead of storing locally the access token somewhere in one of your objects, you directly store them in the key shell. This way you can take advantage of, uh, let's say that in the key chain item you put some uh, 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 ACL, uh, access control level, to say, okay, every time I read this access token, every time I need to upload a photo to Facebook, for example, every time I read it, I want to be prompted for local authentication with Touch ID, for example, in iOS 8. Uh, so that's directly a, a key chain property, and then accessing your access control property will do the job. Nothing more to do. And same thing when you actually um, store them, so you directly store them in the kitchen. So no temporary uh, data. So I really like, um, <clears throat> I really like uh, computed property and I think this is a very nice use case on how to use them. Let's talk about um, immutability. Uh, that's also uh, an important topic. Um, immutability is right in the language with the let and var. You know, I'm sure you know about that. But I think it goes further than just the let and var keyword, actually. In Swift, you have two kinds of type. Value type versus uh, reference type. And what's the difference between the two? It's pretty simple. Um, an instance of a value type uh, will be copy over every time you assign it or you use it as an argument of a function. Whereas um, an instance of a reference type um, will have several owners, meaning that you know, every time you assign it to another variable, uh, it will point to the same instance. Same thing for uh, when you pass them in, in as a function argument. But where there is a, a really a paradigm shift is that um, 
in Swift, most of the types are value types. Um, enum, structs, tuple, primitives. Um, even R and dictionary are implemented with um, structs and generics. So <coughs> they're almost you know, everywhere, and that's why I say we're really surrounded by clones. Something to be aware of. And um, classes and functions are more the exception rather than the rule. OK. Then <coughs> structs are very powerful. You can have method in them. You can implement a protocol. Uh, you can use generic with them. You can do almost everything except inheritance. But uh, otherwise, you know, they're pretty powerful. So then the question is, when do you use struct versus classes? And last time I was discussing with a friend of mine, Dan, and we were looking at this code snippet. And it used to be actually a class. Uh, this code snippet is extracted from the uh, uh, iHogear sync um, library. And this was actually um, a class. And I said to Dan, oh, I think this, this would be a good candidate to be a struct. Because uh, first of all, all the fields are uh, constant. All the value, uh, all the type of the field are value types. And uh, besides, there is also a big hint. If you look at the operator overloading at, at the bottom, you can see that when we need to compare those, we compare them by value. So, so eventually, we change it to, to be a struct. So always ask yourself, do I really need uh, a class, or I could just replace by a struct? Talking about operator overloading, I like to talk about another superpower in, in, in Swift. Uh, it's operator overloading, actually. Um, you use them naturally when uh, you want to, um, to implement comparable or equitable. That's the normal use case. But uh, you can do much more with them. You can define your own matrix if you want, <laughs> meaning, you know, plus or minus could have a, a complete different meaning. Or, and you can also go ASCII art crazy if you want, because you, know, you can use Unicode and whatever you want. So it could be very nice and neat code. But of course, use them with caution, because you know, it's fun to write ESL. Really, I, I think it's, it's one of my uh, geek pleasure, too. But um, always uh, think that uh, people need to be able to read and understand your code. But I still want to show you a use case on how we use operator overloading. Um, here we want in one of a library, which is uh, Irogi or JSONZ. So the goal of the library is basically to serialize some JSON into some uh, object model. So here we have a person JSON. I want to translate that into a person class and an address class. For that, in uh, JSONZ, we just implement a protocol with one method. And in this method, map, we actually do the binding, the mapping of the field. And you see here that we use um, operator overloading. We use a greater than equal operator, which is, you know, which looks like a narrow, so it's very nice um, uh, to explain what it's doing. So how, how do you, and then, and then you just call the um, serialization engine and you get your object back. That's how uh, JSONZ works. Uh, so how do you do operator overloading? It's actually just uh, like a global function. And the first argument is the left operand, and the second argument is the right operand. So in that particular case, let's say that we want to map uh, the uh, last name. So last name is a string. So here you see I use the string type. And we just do some casting, you know, it's nothing much. But now, if I want to deal with the age, which would be an int, I will have to write about overloading for hint, and, and so for boolean, and all the primitive types. So here we can have generics, generics to the rescue. And what is a generic? Generic are just placeholder. It's just a way to say to the compiler, OK, I don't know the type yet. Let's call it T for now. And with generic, you can do much powerful things. For example, you can have type constraints. And I'm going to show you an example. With a type constraint, you can say to the compiler, OK, I don't know the type yet, but I know this type will implement the dot Swift wear t-shirt protocol, for example. So you give more details about, uh, about the type. 
So if we refactor the code that we just had, we can see here that um, I've replaced the, the string and the int and the boolean by a t. Uh, it's a, it's a type parameter. And then uh, I can have only one method. I can go further than that using the type uh, constraint. Uh, remember, we had a person with an address. So when I'm dealing with the address type, I can say, OK, this type is um, implementing JSON serializable. So I know it would be also an object model and go and, and serialize this object too. And we can deal with a one-to-one -one relationship this way. We could do the same with a one-to-many relationship dealing with an array of type that implement JSON serializable. Have a look to the library. It's pretty simple. It's just one file, but it's, it's fun to look at it. So we've been talking about um, <clears throat> type and, uh, and generics, and uh, this is actually a very uh, a paradigm shift, too. Um, when I was working with Objective-C uh, and when I was doing my unit test, I used to enjoy working with library like uh, OCMOC or OHTTP stubs. And those libraries were very handy because I could just create my mock object. Dynamically, I say, OK, create a mock object for this class. And then uh, I set my expectation. I call my method under test and then just uh, uh, verify. Very easy. And when switching to Swift, I say, OK, what kind of library can I use to, to test my Swift, uh, um, my Swift um, code? And there, isn't, and there wasn't any. Because actually, those library works uh, dynamically. So <clears throat> they actually rely on the um, um, reflection API, and there isn't much at the moment in Swift. So how would you go if you want to test a plain Swift object? So you will go, you, instead of mocking, dynamically mocking, you will go uh, stubbing manually. And here is an example, for example, how to do it. So we're back on the OF2 library on the unit test here. And here I want to get abstracted from the persistence layer. Remember the key chain layer. And I also want to get abstracted from the HTTP layer. I just want to test the OF2 flow, you know, the conditional flow. <clears throat> so here I will create a partial mock. So this partial mock will be, will implement my OF2 module, which is the object under test. Um, and I will override only the method I need to override. So in this case, I think I need to override the request authorization code with some fake uh, code. Then I also want to get abstracted from the uh, persistent uh, keychain layer. So the same thing here, I will uh, create a class to, um, to mock uh, the computed property. Notice that in my OF2 partial mock, I inject the persistence layer. Then I just call my method that I want to test. And this one is not mocked. It's the actual uh, request access that will be called. And then simply uh, do some uh, asserts on the state of the object. So you can see here a bit more handwritten coding. But at least it's easy to read. Uh, you don't have to know the. Uh, uh, OC mock uh, API or whatever. It's all written. Okay. Now, <laughs> let's go a bit more. <laughs> we go uh, swizzling in Swift. Another superpower. But actually, it's a bit cheating here because um, this superpower is not a Swift superpower. It comes from uh, Objective C. And, uh, but we can we can say that the Objective-C Swift interoperability is somehow a superpower too that you could use in, in certain particular case. And here I'd like to talk about a library we've, we've written in uh, Swift, which is HTTP stub, uh, a bit similar on the uh, interface uh, to the uh, OH HTTP one, if you're familiar with it. So it allows you to mock your HTTP layer. And here is how we use it. You just first uh, set up your can response. Here I want to, to be a, my HTTP call to be successful and uh, to return me a, a key value um, a JSON. I just then call the method under test and, oops, and do my uh, assertion. Yeah. Um, 
the key thing here is because we're mocking NSURL uh, session, which itself in a read from objective uh, NS, NS object, we can have this bridging working. Um, so in some cases, it, it's very handy. And notice that actually here, we don't inject, uh, we don't need to do any dependency injection because it's all uh, happening at runtime. time. And I think that's it. I uh, finish with a... Uh, I would just end my presentation telling you that you don't need to be a superhero to do to have all this superpower in Swift. All the guys you saw in the picture are part of the our contributor on our project. You can uh, have a look to all the project. Uh, you can find your own uh, Swift open source project and uh, have fun contributed to it. And um, also, you're learning uh, a lot from um, looking at code. And that's it for me. Thank you.